You're an agribusiness executive navigating an increasingly competitive market while trying to grow your company. Mergers and acquisitions are pitched as an accelerant to growth, but many M&A deals destroy more value than they create. Welcome to the Paysetter Pod, where we explore and reveal the perspectives, insights, and approaches for successful mergers and acquisitions. Here's your host, the Integration Paysetter, Joe Mosier. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Pace Center Pod. I'm your host, Joe Mosier, and always I really appreciate you choosing to spend your time with us today. Today, we've got a great interview for you guys. I'm going to be sitting down with Jim Schweigert. Jim is a third generation seedsman and the president of Grow Alliance. He's got a ton of experience in the space, has held and continues to hold big positions at the American Seed Trade Association. Uh, is published in Seed World, really has a lot of contributions to the industry outside of his day-to-day operation and leadership uh, responsibilities. And so it's a real pleasure to have the chance to sit down with him. A little bit about the companies that Jim leads before we get into this. Grow Alliance is the largest independently owned seed supply chain solutions provider in North America. And they specialize in things like seed production, custom seed breeding, and aggregating growers for closed loop and value-added seed products. In addition to their domestic operations, Grow Alliance is also involved in a joint venture in Chile called CIS Alliance or CIS Alliance, and they offer custom seed breeding services in row crops, oil seeds, vegetables, etc., And Jim and Grow Alliance also launched Breeder Direct in 2020 to provide corn and soybean germplasm to seed companies. And this is stuff that Jim's going to talk us through, but it really speaks to the depth and breadth of what they have going on. A couple of things you need to know about today's conversation and some of the reasons I think you're really going to enjoy it. Jim is rich in lessons and very generous in his insights. He's going to talk to us about what does it mean to build and then to preserve a culture of change and innovation in a family-owned business. Talk to us about what does it mean to articulate your core competencies, to do that work of saying, what are we really, really good at? What do we do differently and better than the competition? And then have the courage and discipline to actually act upon that. He's going to help us to, uh, see what the importance is of making big bets that fundamentally change what your company does, who it serves, and how do you do so honoring the past without being captive to what you've done previously. And he's also got some great insights around understanding that the risk of doing nothing is not zero. And in fact, inaction could be the most dangerous decision that you make. And finally, Jim's going to talk to us about how they at Grow Alliance have managed to drive significant change in their company, how they've been able to execute acquisitions, how they've been able to grow in new directions, bring new services and business models to market, and to achieve growth without any major stumbles, not without some heartburn, maybe not without some friction, but without major stumbles. And they did it without needing to bring in outside advisors. And so he's going to talk to us about what is the secret to not needing help. So very excited to have the time with Jim. And with that, let's get into the interview. Jim, good afternoon. Thanks for coming on the Pace Setter Pod today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Yeah, this is great. We had a we had a really good uh, discussion, an introductory discussion here a couple months ago before the holidays, and uh, it was pretty clear pretty quickly to me that uh, you're a thinker in addition to being a, a doer and someone who's you know uh, deeply steeped in the in the space where you operate, which we'll talk about here, um, and and just the exact profile of the of the kind of agribusiness leader we want to have on the show. So I'm I'm really excited. Um, before we before we get in between your ears and get after all your thoughts and insights and perspectives, um, for those listeners that are maybe only adjacently aware or maybe aren't aware of of, of you and, and your work, you know, you've got a lot going on uh, with your your roles at, at Grow Alliance, you know, Breeder Direct, CIS. There's a ton here, so maybe start off by you know sharing with our listeners an overview of of those businesses. Uh, the roles that you play and and what those businesses do, so that we can get grounded in that work, uh, where you spend your time and the spaces that you compete in. Yeah, so uh, everything we do at Grow Alliance is really about bringing seed supply chain solutions to the broader seed industry. Uh, And as you mentioned, we we have three business units that we execute that strategy through. 
Um, the main one being Grow Alliance. Uh, at Grow Alliance, we're providing nursery services, uh, so custom breeding services in, in a variety of species in the U.S. Uh, we're also doing seed production, primarily in corn and soybeans, uh, in the U.S. through five uh, different locations um, across the Midwest. Um, so providing, you know, from the beginning of the nursery work all the way through finished seed production, and then extending into logistics, um, seed delivery, return, rework, and providing all of those kind of services under the Grow Alliance umbrella. CIS Alliance then is how we execute the counter season portion of that supply chain. Um, so we're doing custom seed breeding in Chile and a variety of nursery services there on up to 20 different species a year. So vegetables, rural crops, oil seeds, uh, re really the entire gamut of work that we were doing in Chile uh, under CIS Alliance. And then Breeder Direct is our newest business unit that we launched in 2020. And there we're helping support the seed industry through uh, germplasm access in corn and soybeans. Um, so we're out licensing corn and soy germplasm to independent seed companies. So really ex exciting to be able to provide a seed company everything that they need to be in business from genetics, services, production, beginning to end their entire seed supply chain all under one roof. Then we like to say you, you could be a seed company in, in the U.S. Uh, by partnering with Grow Alliance. All you need is a laptop and a warehouse and we take care of everything else for you. Uh, and if you need a warehouse, we've got those too. So uh, really exciting uh, to see what we've done in our business um, and how that's branched out into a, a lot of different opportunities, but always coming back to that being a seed supply chain solutions provider. That's great. Thank you for the overview. And on the breeder direct side, just as, as an aside, I mean, that business is in growth mode. If I understand correctly, you even just recently completed an acquisition there as well. Is that correct? Yeah, we announced in December that we acquired um, rights to access the Farmers Business Network corn germplasm pool, which is a very significant pool of corn germplasm. So this gives us a lot of opportunities for crossing that uh, germplasm with other corn from other originators to make new, unique, uh, novel hybrids for seed companies, as well as outlicense the portfolio of, of seed um, hybrids that they had already de developed. So adds significant depth to an already really strong lineup in corn for Breeder Direct. And uh, yeah, we, we continue to look for those kind of opportunities because one of the, the biggest challenges that seed companies have is finding good competitive corn germplasm at a, a royalty price that they can make a margin on. And uh, so we're trying to answer that call through the relationships we have both with breeders and with seed companies and make those connections um, to offer that solution. Yeah, it's it's very exciting to watch. I mean, and, and we're going to get into a little bit of uh, today around your just the the laser like focus that you've already sort of illustrated here today by talking about how all three of your operating entities really do come down to one underlying core purpose. It's the st strategic through line of of all your holdings, um, and that comes out a lot. But before we get into what the business was because it is a process of evolution and it's a, it's a pretty interesting story. You know, there's been considerable consolidation in the seed business for, yeah. for some time. And as one should expect, that's going to create all sorts of competitive pressure for independent seed companies. From your standpoint, from the way you see the world, the conversations that you're having, et cetera, what's the outlook here? Is the pace of consolidation likely to sustain what it's been over the recent past do you expect this to abate and maybe slow down or decelerate? Is it going to accelerate? And then further, as you think about that, that consolidation trend, what are the other trends or changes that you're watching that help shape the decisions you're making around strategy and growth? Well, the, the first one is, you know, we think about, you know, maybe the last um, 15 or so years of independent seed companies in the United States there was a significant amount of consolidation in the kind of 2000s, late 2000s, where you had multinational companies buying independent seed businesses. And there were, you know, more than a dozen transactions in that time frame. It was really, really active. And a lot of seed brands exited the market in that round. And then subsequently, as they were, you know, kind of decommissioned by the buyer, uh, the acquirers over time, 
So that was really a significant round of consolidation. And then there was a bit of a period of adjustment. Everybody was kind of getting used to the new marketplace and the multinationals were digesting all these acquisitions. They had significant changes in their own businesses, you know, with um, the creation of Corteva, the uh, Bayer Monsanto um, acquisition, Syngenta becoming part of ChemChina. And so there was a lot of just uh, churn at the multinational level uh, there for a few years. Recently, there's been independent companies buying other independent companies. Uh, There was four or five of those acquisitions last year. And the year prior, there were a a few as well. In terms of future consolidation, I don't know how much true consolidation we're going to see. Meaning I'm not sure how many more independent companies are going to buy other independent companies or what appetite the multinationals have to buy an independent. I think the way we're going to see the kind of quote consolidation happening is independent companies just exiting the business altogether, whether that's by their own choice at a generational moment when they don't have another generation to transfer to and they don't really have a good path to being acquired or they just find themselves uncompetitive in the marketplace and aren't able to continue on in in the way and shape that they are today. So it is kind of a form of consolidation, but it's, it's not the type of consolidation through acquisition that we've seen historically. It's, it's more just exits. Interesting. So it's a thinning of the market, basically, of the competitive landscape. And maybe something we can talk about too, or if you want to answer it now, I imagine given that the independent seed company is a, is a primary focus of your business, fewer is not necessarily bad because fewer could be bigger, but fewer also does mean a contracting marketplace in terms of potential buyers. And so do you see that as a competitive risk or threat, or is that largely an opportunity where you guys are at today? Well, we're very optimistic by nature. We're very entrepreneurial. So anytime we see a a challenge or a threat, we try to find the opportunity in that. But frankly, we are concerned about the the future of a lot of independent seed companies. And our business largely relies on those companies being competitive. Us ourselves being a, you know, family owned seed company started in 1941. Uh, You know, so we have deep roots as an independent business in this marketplace. And those companies make up a a large share of our business activities. So we're concerned about that. And it's it's one of the the big motivations for us providing new and creative solutions in an ongoing way, like always surveying that market and that landscape and asking, asking these questions directly of seed companies, like what's the biggest hurdle for you to achieve a, a positive margin today and in the future? What's your biggest risk as an independent seed company? And what keeps you up at night? And then we collect these answers. We review them, think about them internally, do brainstorming. Uh, we do red teaming, um, all kinds of different activities about, and to try to like put ourselves in those positions. And having been in the retail business in the past, we, we understand some of those concerns and pressures and, and threats and, and just the emotions around the, the seed business. And it, we come up with our best ideas that we think can can help. And sometimes the, our ideas don't really work, but uh, we, we keep flipping over rocks. We keep looking for new new answers to those those challenges and questions and, and trying to provide solutions to uh, to the industry. Yeah, I, kind of starting with where you started there, I, mean, I think optimism is sort of table stakes for the for agribusiness writ large. Yeah. For the seed business, you almost need to be recklessly optimistic <laughs> to stay in it year on year. So I think that's a you know that's certainly something we can will appreciate and understand and probably is a good validation to look in the mirror and say well, how is it that I stay optimistic every year? Yeah, you know, I'm from Minnesota, so being a Vikings fan, you kind of are always like, well, there's always next year. There's never next year to be clear, right? It's it's. <laughs> but um, so let's. I want to come back around to this. I think this is we're sort of nibbling now at this at the story behind Grow Alliance, behind Sis Alliance, behind Breeder Direct. And so I'm going to take a different angle here, but 15 years ago or so, the concept of core competence, your core competencies as an organization was, was hot, right? Everyone was reading Good to Great and Jim Collins. And it's, you know, maybe I even know the dates wrong, but that's when I first became acquainted with it, the, the work. And it changed the way a lot of people thought about their businesses. And that's true both inside and, and outside of ag, right? We, don't, we haven't not cornered the market on spending time thinking about this. 
And I would argue that over the last 15, 20 years, that, that thinking around core competence actually contributed in a pretty meaningful way to the disaggregation of many businesses. So they, they realized that there's a point at which diversification beyond some kind of logical boundary created risk more than mitigated it, right? The old conglomerate models, and I'm talking about much larger organizations, they saw risk and diver- or they saw risk management and diversification because you kind of had, you're placing multiple bets. But then over time, people started to realize that that actually dilutes your focus, right? It creates confusion for the customers. It creates confusion for your employees. It makes it pretty difficult to build any sort of a cohesive strategy around what it is you're trying to accomplish. And the idea of core competence is durable, and you still hear people talk about it. But what I think is infrequent back then and is outright scarce now, and maybe I've got this entirely wrong, this is how I see it, seeing people actually make decisions and particularly make uncomfortable strategic decisions that really dial in on core competence is scarce. I mean, this is about addition through subtraction, right? You can go farther and accomplish more when you try to do less. And from my understanding, I think it'd be good for you to share your story here. Grow Alliance specifically is kind of a perfectly illustrative example of this. And I'm I'm talking about your ability to recognize some of the limiting factors or constraints that you had in your legacy retail operations and how you came to the decision to adjust and evolve into the business that you have now, right? And it was that evolution that was sort of the enabler of, of growth. And so maybe you can, with all that, that long preamble, maybe you can tell us how you came to that decision. You know, was core competence something you guys were actually thinking about? I don't want to project onto you, but what was the process like for you emotionally and practically? And what did you guys learn as you sort of said, okay, look, we've done this one thing for a long time and we're going to now do something else. And I think in in, in answering that question, you can also tell the the more comprehensive story of Grow Alliance. Yeah, because I, you know, I do think even though kind of the the seminal moment that that we'll focus on happened in, you know, 2004, 2005, the, the roots of that actually started in 1941 when my grandpa planted two acres of hybrid seed corn up in north central Wisconsin. Our company today is based in Cuba City, Wisconsin, southwest part of the state. But I was born in Ladysmith, um, north of Eau Claire, about two hours straight east of the Twin Cities. And our family farming operation was centered up there in not exactly the heart of the Corn Belt. I always say it's a great place to hunt fish and snowmobile. But if you were going to start a seed corn company or a seed business uh, in general, you would certainly not pick that that location to do it. But that's where the family farm was. And my grandpa's motivation to plant hybrid seed corn and give that a try in, in 41 was try to find a way to make more money off a small farm in a pretty tough place to be. And uh, thankfully for him and for me, and for the whole family, it worked. Uh, but he faced a lot of criticism, uh, you know, being the first one to do, to, to tassel seed corn and cross two different inbred lines together, raise the ire of neighbors. They thought he was crazy. They didn't know what he was doing. And mm-hmm. it was silly. But when it worked, then he started selling seed to neighbors. And he thought, boy, this is actually pretty good. I can make more money than just farming. I can make more money than being in dairy. And uh, maybe this is something that I should do. But he had some resistance to change. And so the seed selling piece of the business was very minor uh, until my uh, mom and dad took over the business in 1977. They recognized the big upside opportunity for having a retail seed brand in that area. And they de-emphasized the farming activity and focused uh, primarily on sales of seed to farmers in our own brand. At the time, that was called North Grow Seeds. And so they expanded the brand of that business. And they were producing their own seeds, selling to a, a broad area in Wisconsin, Minnesota, getting down in, into parts of Iowa and southern Wisconsin. But they didn't have enough production capacity in, in the geography they were in. Uh, just wasn't a good place to produce seed corn for a a broader group of customers. And so they started looking for a facility more in the heart of the Corn Belt. So to do something a little bit different and continue to produce their own seed, but find a better location. 
And in 1993, we probably did even a more bold move than we did in 04, 05. Uh, my dad made the decision to buy a seed corn facility in Cuba City, a formerly a Jake's facility uh, that I think Micogen actually had owned at the time we bought it and moved the seed company and the, the family from northern Wisconsin to Cuba City. And we then had significant capacity to do production. We had, we're much closer to a bigger piece of the market and uh, really set us up well there to grow and expand the company. But it's pretty uh, unique in the seed business to move a business. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, I've you know, done a lot of thinking about this to see what other companies have relocated uh, in the seed business, and it's not many. So then, I mean, so it's it's a bit reductive, but it's almost, you don't say it's, it's, in, it's in the DNA of the company to kind of watch where things are going, see the operating constraints that you're under, and then make those decisions. And, and maybe core competence, which was where I started, is, is not actually part of it. But then to talk about the the decision, the, the run-up to the planning, the execution, reestablishing your equilibrium about exiting retail to make this final big adjustment into that first iteration of Grow Alliance, which I know the story is evolving daily, but how did that come to be? And what was the calculus there? Well, the biggest driver of the move from northern Wisconsin to Cuba City was to... to be closer to the market to to expand the the retail sales of the business, and from 1993 through you know early 2000, that was the 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 main focus and strategy of the business. Because we had extra seed production capacity, in I think in, in 1994 we actually started doing some contract production work for a few other companies just as a way to, to utilize the asset a little bit more. But in 1994, 95, 96, 97, the idea was that the focus was going to be on the retail brand. And this was something we were doing to fill in. It was helping another seed company, which was good for them, helped us utilize the asset. But as a few more years ticked by, we realized that this is what we were really good at. We had a, a very good location, a quality facility. We had we were able to make additional investments in the facility in the early 2000s and to, to make it a really nice uh, production site. Had good teams uh, in place, good grower base in place. And when I came back to the business then from, I'd gone to school and worked in the public relations industry for a while, came back to the company in 2003 we started looking at a broader survey of the industry to really understand where was our place as a retail company, what was going on with uh, access to traits and to genetics, what was our competitive position there, what was our competitive position on the contract production side. And we saw a lot of companies exiting production to focus on retail. So as we thought about that, say, well, would we exit production to focus on retail? It's like, well, we have... The best thing we have is the production location, the asset, the people in place, and, and the grower base we've got. The thing we're not as good at is retail. And so if we have to pick one of these, if, if we had to, which would we choose? Which is more difficult for the industry to duplicate? Capital costs were rising. Uh, new technology um, was being introduced into seed production, things like color sorters and those kind of things were, uh, were coming into play. Seed treatment was a lot more specific. And so you had to spend a lot more money to be a seed producer than you did, you know, in the 1980s or 1990s. So we made the, the pivot to completely exit retail and to focus exclusively on third-party services to the industry. The thinking was if everybody else was going to exit production and go to retail, somebody's going to have to do this production. And there was a contract production market place already established. It, it wasn't very well defined. It, it, you know, it was not as high quality of an industry as it could have been. And we really found a, a nice opportunity there to, to uh, slip into that market and provide a great service to companies that needed it, uh, allow those businesses to spend their money on selling more seed. We would help them produce, distribute, uh, do all the things on the back end that they needed. And uh, that was a, a huge move for the company. Wow. 
Poorly executed mergers and acquisitions destroy more value than they create. They can set your company back years. To defend your firm's position in the marketplace, you need access to the leading practices that unlock the greater potential of your people, processes, and systems. If you are undertaking a company transformation or pursuing an acquisition as a vehicle to grow, set up a call with Joe by visiting www.mosherecg.com. And this is one of those examples of, you know, it, it's so clear when you can do a sober assessment, right? Years after the fact, when you know what the what the outcome has been, at least up until today, right? And so I can understand how the analysis, the view of the marketplace, seeing that people were exiting contract production because it was hard, because it was getting complex, because it was getting more and more expensive and, you know, people piling into retail. And so I can, I can understand how you do the assessment, but what... I think is really worth noting here is you did the assessment and then you still acted. So you still, everyone else is running away and you ran in the opposite direction. And that's just, I think that that's just a really interesting moment of saying, you know, we've, we've, we've got the conviction. We get the conviction in the market as it stands today. We have a point of view on where it's going tomorrow. And we've got, deeply held and optimistic belief on uh, what we can do, what our core competence is, what our capabilities are. I have to imagine though, there was some second guessing. Some folks in the, in the room saying, are, are we sure? I mean, I know we think it's a great idea, but are we sure that we can do this for everyone else and we're going to take a big non-consensus bet? We are the contrarians. Yeah. What did that happen or what did that look like to the extent that you're willing to share? Well, you know, I think it's, uh, you, you know, certainly we had conversations about, you know, what is the viability of a contract only production company and could that be better than what we have now? And I, I think businesses get into these situations all the time. It's not un- unique to us. It's if you go back through historical ex- examples of, you know, places like Kodak and, Nokia and, you know, BlackBerry is another one. I mean, businesses that have something that's really good in the moment, but you look up maybe five to 10 years and you say, you know, there's some headwinds here that uh, could derail us. So you've got to make a bold decision either way. It's not staying and doing the same thing isn't less risky than doing something different. And I think a lot of people have that kind of that, that kind of perspective that, well, if, I, if I'm doing the same thing I'm doing now, that's a lot safer bet than changing what I'm doing to go after this other opportunity. And I would just ask them, is it really? Is doing the same thing that you're doing today, knowing that there's headwinds and challenges, recognizing the possible deficiencies in either the, the business you've built or the, the market that you're in or kind of the, the situation that, that's that's circling around your company, just the general business environment, is that really less risky than doing something different? Because, you know, doing nothing is a choice and you're making that choice every day. So, mm-hmm. yes, it is, it, you know, it seems like a very bold move to do something that totally changes your business. But it's equally, <laughs> I think it's equally bold to, to never do anything to change your business and hope that somehow it just improves. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's a fair point. Like, there's the sometimes the perception of stability, the perception of safety. Simply, in, in the when you look, you know, take an expansive view of the future, and you don't look over the long term, right? The horizon's the end of your nose, or the end of your meeting, or the end of the end of the day, or end of the week. You know, you you can kind of perceive a certain level of stability, predictability, and frankly, you know, that kind of inertia of comfort. Of yeah. not changing it, I think it's a it's a fair point though. I mean, doing nothing despite what all the signals are telling you is uh, not necessarily as uh, effective as you might might believe. Nonetheless, I will contend that there's a lot of people that still will intellectually understand what you just outlined and yet fail to respond to the changes. So I, I just think it's noteworthy and uh, and something I wanted to definitely call out today. Well, yeah, I talked a little bit about kind of the evolution of, of the business over time. And so if you think about, and, and I, I think if companies are thinking about their business today, or you're a family-owned seed business that has been around, let's say, 40, 50 years, 
And you kind of develop this perception that, oh, we've always been the type of company that we are today. And, you know, we've, we've made some small changes. We've done some little things over time. But I would actually challenge them to look a little bit deeper into the into choices they've made in the past that now seem like not big deals, but in the moment probably really were. So in our, in our family history, the first one is to grow hybrid seed corn. A big change. You have no idea how it's going to work out. Two acres, you know, wasn't the entire farm and what wasn't the big farm, but it's still two acres you're going to take out of production. It's a lot of time and effort into something that could end up being nothing. So that, mm-hmm. that's, that's one thing. And then the family exited dairy. Uh, you know, we were milking cows, like every good Wisconsin farmer, you know, needed to back then. And so you exit dairy. Now you're doing something different again. That's a big change. We had a feeder pig operation. So we had like about 100 sows and raised feeder pigs for a long time. When I was growing up as a kid, that's uh, one of the things I got to do was uh, work in the hog barn and, you know, a lot of crazy experiences and that. But uh, as we invested more in the seed business, we sold all the, all the pigs, exited that piece. We did contract green bean production for a number of years and then exited that to focus more on corn. And so you start looking at those little, those, all those decisions over time. There's more of that history probably in a given company that a lot of people sitting in the management of it today probably realize just because they're not thinking about it in that kind of context. Yeah, fair point. I mean, you look back and every, most every company has had at some point a significant capital outlay for a major expansion. Building a new or rebuilding a seed plant, buying additional offsite storage or cold storage, which is a significant investment, you know, maybe starting to operate a little mini dedicated fleet, getting into new products, whatever it might be. You know, in the, in the M&A side, sometimes we can look back and people say this is a, the first big change we've dealt with in a long time. And when we look back just seven to 10 years, we say, well, you guys have, it's a new logo, new company name, new go-to-market strategy, new technology, new structure. You've got all these things that feel incremental to your point in the moment, but they're evolutionary and they have an accumulated change effect. One thing I want to call out here, if you're wondering, so everyone's listening has already established that the Schweiger family is incredibly entrepreneurial and, and likes to, to place bets. Note though that Jim didn't say I had to work in the hog barn. He said, I got to work in the hog barn. So that's a little insight, I think, into how he sees his work and his legacy and his family. Let's talk for a moment about, again, understand this transition to the current iteration of the organization or the, the business units. You now find yourself in a position where what I would say are your, your, your legacy competition, and it's the seed business, let's be honest. It's a lot of times it's friendly competition as well, right? But they are the legacy competitors are now your customers. So is it evident to them now, and, and I guess at the beginning, was it evident to them that your decision to leverage your investments that you made and, and all the different complexities around contracted seed production, you're going to leverage your own investments to the benefit of others. In doing so, you were seeking to not just drive returns for your business, but you were going to de-risk the business for other independent seed companies. What was their adoption curve like? Like, what was? How did trust play into that? How did you actually establish? I mean, clearly they can see it, the need, and clearly you guys are a credible provider because you've done it. You're not outsiders coming into the seed business that did a market analysis and said this is an opportunity. We're going to build a business around it. You're like, no, we're already doing it. But I got to imagine there are some sort of barriers to adoption there in making that adjustment. Yeah, it's really interesting because we've. We've moved along this supply chain in the seed business multiple times. And, you know, the first one exiting retail and becoming focused on third party services was the first one. And some companies were, you know, they understood that transition very clearly, or we were able to articulate it better to some than others, apparently, because uh, we had quick adoption from some companies and others just still always saw us as a retail seed company that was the competition. And, you know, that's happened multiple times in our company history. As we moved into nursery services, there were some that said, well, you guys are just a producer. So do you really know how to do hand crossing? And can you really 
uh, you know, you know, manage inbred increases and pilots and crossing blocks. And well, yes, we have the people, the talent. We we got into that business through an acquisition of a facility that had a very, very experienced, incredible staff. And those are the people that are going to be doing that type of activity. So yes, we, we have that experience through an acquisition. But it's been interesting because as we've changed and involved the companies, it's sometimes the, the folks that have known us the longest have the slowest kind of ability to understand the, what the new company is doing and the new direction and the new services we provide. It's like they still, they still think about the business back when they were introduced to it. The new companies we meet see us as a very different company than somebody that we may be working with for 25 years. That's a perception that we need to do a better job of, of like fully educating folks on so they understand all the scope of services we do, the activities that we do, because we are trying to build this whole suite and, and we do now have the whole suite of activities to where you just plug your business into ours and we can connect you with growers, with um, seed production, nursery, distribution. And we find a lot of success with startup companies. They maybe have a technology or an innovation and they need to get to market somehow. And they've got a lot of decisions to make. What do they do with their capital? Do they spend it? Do they build their own vertically integrated business? Or do they partner with somebody like us who gives them all of those uh, solutions on day one and we do it as a service contract? So it's really interesting as you talk to companies, there's a the, the length of time that they know us or have known us tends to impact the way they see us. And that, that's really interesting. And so it's not necessarily, from what I'm hearing, it's not a a deficit of trust or credibility. It's just a deficit in perception around where do you play. Was the exit of retail, because when we say exit of retail, that feels very binary. We were a retail business and then we weren't. Was that a, did you slowly spin that off and wind that down? Or was that you opened the door and jettisoned it on the side of the plane one day and that was a hard exit and it, you're done? How did that transition go? It uh, yeah we exited with in with two um, transactions si- almost simultaneously so okay. one part of our marketing area went to one company and the other part went to another one yeah. yep so what, one year we sold seed to farmers the next year we didn't yeah there's no ambiguity there that is a that's what you call a one way door I mean I guess you can always reacquire one of those businesses or buy another one or start a new one, but that is a, that's a hard exit. So it, it does demonstrate the commitment to the direction that you're choosing to take. Yeah, we, we burned the ships on the shore there. We weren't getting back into the retail business right away. And then, you know, licenses too. We had, we had licenses to be able to sell traits and germplasm and we exited those agreements as well. So interesting. Well, let's talk here as we kind of get towards the end about M&A. Uh, it's a topic that, that I spend a lot of time in and this show, um, is, is heavily focused on you guys, and you, you know, we've talked about acquiring FBN's germplasm suite, and, and talked about some other divestitures that you've done and other acquisitions. So you've got some deals under your belt. We need to talk about it. What are some of the lessons that you, yeah, you've learned, Jim, including the painful ones? You know, while you're sourcing deals and, and closing them and managing the integrations. And I want to point out, as I ask that question, that. You've done those transactions almost entirely, if not entirely, in-house, and you've not blown up your business in the process. <laughs> so that's why I, I do want to understand what the pain was first, and then we're going to come back to what that secret sauce has been, uh, to the extent that you're willing to, to, to share your observations there. But yeah, what, what have you learned and what didn't uh, go as, as well as you might have expected? The number one thing is, you know, don't try to put a square peg into a round hole. And, you know, I think... There's a lot of times companies get into this. Um, it, it may come from a, a, a really well thought out strategic vision to say, you know, we need to expand into this area. We need to grow the business. You know, we, we need to do something. And how are we going to accomplish that? Let's go look for deals and make something happen. If you put too many, you know, what I'll call like self imposed deadlines on things, mm-hmm. you can really end up getting into bad transactions. And you've got to have speed and patience at the exact same time, which is really, really tough. And people that know me know I'm not patient at all. 
And so I don't like to have to, you know, if you have a great idea and you've ha- you have a great strategy that you want to execute and you see the opportunity, you just want to go get it and make it happen. But it also has to work. Otherwise, it's not going to be good for your business, for the employees that are affected and the, the business that's been acquired. The seller of the business isn't going to like what's happened to it, you know, after they're not involved anymore. And so you've just got to, you can't force anything to work and you can't art, operate under artificial timelines because you're going to end up with a deal that you don't want. That's number one. Number two, the deal has to work for you and the seller. It can't be a one-sided situation. So you go in and think that either we're going to get a great deal, we're going to you know scoop up something way below market, and that that's going to be you know great for us. There maybe there's a reason that you can get it way below market that you're not seeing in the due diligence or the the review of the deal. So you've got to be really careful about that situation. And then two. If you're picking it up at at a well below market price, what impact does that have on the the employees that are still there? Because those are folks that you need to have working on your behalf day in and day out. And if the seller has a bad taste in their mouth after the deal is done, then your ability to operate that business long term is going to be impacted. The person you bought it from had relationships with all the vendors. They know all the employees. They have relationships with all the landowners and customers. And there, there's a really wide net there that if that seller thinks they got taken advantage of, that's not good for you as the acquirer. And a lot of people don't really don't really think about that piece. And the other side of it, you can't overpay. If you overpay, you're doomed from the beginning because now it's going to drain cash flow on the pieces of the business that are doing well. And uh, you can't do that too many times and stay around. So it's got to be a reasonable deal for the buyer and the seller for the short term and for the long term. I think that's a really interesting observation around, uh, it's almost the the downside of a smoke and deal on the business, right? We see a disc, we saw the opportunity to acquire a business that maybe was already in your sights or fits the profile of what a, you know, an acquisition looked like when you formed that strategy six, 12, 18 months ago. And this, this business becomes available. And for whatever reason, you're able to get at a huge discounted price. you're right. That's that's not all upside. If it's not communicated properly, if the people's expectations aren't managed properly, you could be the most strategic buyer, the best suited to own it. Frankly, the best position to nurture and sort of help the legacy of that business endure over time by recapitalizing it, giving access to new markets, investing in, in ways prior ownership can't. But if you don't package that front end part of it correctly, if you're always seen as you were opportunistic, you're a vulture, <laughs> you you know you you came in and you swooped in and, and got us at a moment of weakness. You're right; that is going to be an incredibly hard thing with suppliers, with customers, with employees, with former ownership to get off from under. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think it um, the reason we've got that perspective is is kind of number three on my list would be. You're, you know, you're buying a business. You're not just buying assets and customer relationships. You're buying the collective knowledge and expertise of all those people that work in that business. And you aren't going to be able to walk in there day one. I mean, you know, we're talking more complex deals, not like okay, you bought a gas station or you know you bought a, a residential property and you're going to rent it out or something like that. But in a functional business, all these interactions between the customers, the suppliers, vendors, contractors, all of those relationships are, are really, really important. And if you don't have the right people from that acquired company having the right conversations, though all that infrastructure can make your life very, very difficult. So, you know, for example, if you're buying a business and they've been getting a deal on their snow removal because they let the other guy put stuff in their dumpster occasionally. Little things like that, if you don't think through all of those pieces of the transaction, you'll find yourself with a really bad neighbor because now they have to go buy their own dumpster and now they're just upset at you. And well, I'm not going to plow your snow anymore. And now instead of them plowing your snow, when you focus on your business, you've got to send your warehouse guy out every time it snows and 
plow and rent a tractor. And that's just a very small example. But if you take that across maybe a hundred vendor relationships at a certain location and dozens of growers that you're working with, all of that infrastructure piece, if you can't operate that smooth because you haven't thought about the people post that post transaction, you're just going to get buried in detail that'll destroy the strategy right from the beginning. Yeah. In some transactions, you will see that sit as intangible value on the balance sheet or in, in, the, in, the, in the valuation of the business, right? The, the relationships with these particular suppliers or, or the, the, the goodwill tied to the logo and the brand, et cetera. But there, like you said, there's a lot of times that these sort of almost like the, the trade partnerships, the industry partnerships, the supply chain partnerships, and just how the business runs sometimes are not properly accounted for. And you're right. I mean, one time running out in the parking lot and scolding the neighbor because you saw him dump his recycling in your bin. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're both looking down the barrel of a big snowstorm here today as we record. Um, right. Yeah, it's it'd be nice to know that someone's going to take care of the parking lot for customers arriving on Saturday morning. So here's the last question then. If you could boil it down. So you gave a lot of good insights there. And it's a lot of the things that are, I mean, it's they're very powerful. But saying them and doing them, so not overpaying, not falling victim to urgency, self-imposed urgency, even worse, properly valuing relationships and the intangibles, you know, and being smart about where you make changes and where you don't, you know, make sure the deal works for the customer or deal works for both the acquirer and the acquired, all those things. It's great insights, but to do them something different. So what is the secret to not needing help. Because I think that's what's also remarkable here is you guys do this and M&A is 100% incremental to the demands you already have. Yeah. And yet you guys are largely able to, to execute these on your own. So what's going on there? Well, with uh, we, we're fortunate that as the business has grown, you know, I've been able to build a really, really strong operational team to... To, to, to execute all the different things that we commit to as a business. And so the one thing I'm always checking myself against is, you know, you can't make commitments that the business can't deliver on because you, you can definitely overgrow your ability to execute. And there, there's examples of that in history too. Um, there's examples of that in the seed industry where let's just go acquire, let's just go, uh, you, you know, make all these big moves and then, you know, we'll just be able to absorb them. You've got to be able to uh, be disciplined enough to not take on things you can't do and just grow the business to a, to a point that it can't survive and it can't operate itself. Um, the, a retired seedsman once told me, make sure you're always running your business and that your business doesn't run you. And I thought that was a really, really um, interesting point kind of along those lines. The, you know, to me, it's, you know, looking for new deals is really fun. I I enjoy it a lot. You get to meet just amazing people. You uh, you learn so much about how other people run their business and what they think about and what they care about. Um, Then the seed business, I think, is really special because the people that are running these these facilities are, uh, you know, typically their families. They've been in it for a long time. And they don't want the they don't want the building to just close. They don't want their employees to not have a job. Mm-hmm. And so every acquisition that we've made of a seed facility has been either a current or a legacy family-owned seed company. And to this day, every single one of those acquisitions, we still have original employees at every one of those places. So that's a, I think a real strong testament to the fact that we did it the right way. We, you know, uh, not everybody is still there. Of course, the businesses change, people retire, move on, but we've been able to maintain uh, those people that were originally there to a large extent. And I I think that's really awesome. You learn a lot about your business by going through deals with people, even if you don't come to a, to a conclusion and you start to see your own business a lot clearer and a lot different. Just kind of one Example, there was a company that we looked at acquiring and it was a kind of a sole proprietor business. And you could tell the guy running it just had a a huge amount of pride in everything he had done and absolutely worked his butt off to build a successful company. But there were so many things that he was doing that we as an acquirer couldn't replicate. They were selling 
uh, still selling, uh, you know, miscellaneous forage and grass seeds as a storefront to the local community. They had done a lot of the construction projects themselves, including electrical and a lot of different things like that, that, that we would have a contractor do. And the sweat equity in the facility was off the charts valuable to this person. But in that whole thing, it's just because it was hard and just because you put a ton of that effort in doesn't mean that that actually creates value for somebody that's acquiring it. Mm -hmm. So then I think about that in our company, like, okay, so what are the things that we're doing that we believe are valuable because they're really hard for us to do? Is that actual value? If it doesn't show up anywhere on a P&L or an improved asset, are we just doing work that's hard that we then perceive as value? But when I put on this other hat and look at it through a different lens, I say that doesn't create much value. Mm-hmm. So the ability to look to look at your business as an acquirer because you've had firsthand experience seeing somebody else's business like that, to me, has just been really valuable. Yeah, it's the first time someone's actually spoken to that directly, Jim, and I'm glad you did because it's, it's, it's spot on. I mean, getting the teasers, signing a, an NDA, and then getting a look at the actual prospectus on a, on a business, you, you do, you, you learn so much. And it is, it's, it is addictive, and it's intoxicating, and it's fun, and you kind of start to feel the juices going. And then the questions become, you know, how do we make it work, not should we try to make it work? And, um, but if you, if, you have that, if you have the presence of mind to at some point stop and also then reflect introspectively, you know, reflect what does this tell me about the organization that we have today? Where have we overvalued our effort relative to the value that it's created, right? How would this be perceived by somebody else coming and looking at us as either a supplier of services and solutions to them or if someone was going to be acquiring if we just chose to divest to this particular asset to this business, et cetera. So I think that's that your clarity of mind and, and, and vision on that is, is, is impressive. Clearly, we could go on for much longer. I do want to be respectful of, of your time and our listeners who have gone the distance. I'll probably deserve a break as well. But I do want to say, you know, that was great as expected. You outperformed pretty high expectations. And I, I appreciate that you chose to take time out of your day and running three different businesses. And you've got a lot going on clearly. But uh, you're, the fact that you chose to take the time, share your thoughts, kind of similar to your business, I mean, to the benefit of others in the, in the industry. And the fact that you're so open with your journey and your approach and what you've learned along the way really means a lot. For those listeners that are interested in learning more about Grow Alliance, Sys Alliance, Breeder Direct, or want to get in touch with you, where should they go? Well, you can learn a lot about at uh, growalliance.com. We've got links to all the different businesses. Uh, there's also the, the announcement we made this week. So we're uh, um, partnering with a company called Seedex that uses AI-powered software to sort vegetable seeds for improved germination and purity. And so we'll be adding a service center for seed sorting in Salinas, California. So another location for us, I'm in the West Coast partnering with a vegetable seed company. So another a big move and step out of kind of extending that seed supply chain service concept and vision to a new geography and to a new crop type here in the U.S. So that's really exciting. And then you can always find me uh, on email, jim.schweigert at growalliance.com uh, if you want to get in touch with me directly uh, or connect with me on LinkedIn. So I put a lot of content out there and kind of talk about what we're doing as a company and, and as a seed in, in industry in general. So be happy to connect. That's great, Jim. And, and literally in the course of the interview, you guys close another transaction and you continue to evolve the story. So we can't even keep up in the context of talking about M&A. <laughs> M&A deals are happening in the background. So, well, we'll have you back to talk about that one as well at some point in the future. But uh, thank you again. And to our listeners, thank you as always for tuning in. Remember to like and subscribe to the Pace Setter Pod wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find or follow me, Joe Mosier, on LinkedIn or visit us online at MosierCG.com to set up a call. If you, if you need to talk, let's do it. So I'm wishing you uh, safe, sustainable, and a profitable execution. And uh, thank you for the work that you do for our industry. Catch you next time. This is the podcastfactory.com.